Hey everybody, uh, we're here today to talk to you about the advanced classes. So yesterday we went through the regular classes. Today we're going to talk about how each of the advanced classes works and how the characters advance into those. Uh, so in a previous session we've talked about how when you get 10 experience points on your character sheet, uh, sorry if I zoom out fast, so when your experience hits 10 you will have the choice to become an advanced class character. So it shows you right here in your recovery phase. Uh, um, advanced uh, advanced class if you have 10 experience once per game so you cannot make this choice more than once per game and how you choose will impact the rest of your game uh, the first class we're going to go through is perfect paladin and that is a combination of the priest and the fighter so if you are either a priest or a fighter class you can advance to become a perfect paladin a perfect paladin will gain you four combat instead of whatever combat bonus you already had so uh, we're going to use uh, just an example card here from Kane. So if Kane had a plus three combat before, now he's going to remove that plus three but gain plus four instead. And that's how the rest of these will work as well. So they don't add on, they replace the card that you had before that. Um, so in addition to the combat, he replaces all other ability he has. So this entire card basically goes away. Um, can you stay the entire game as just a fighter class? Yes, you certainly could, but you'll see with some of these cards there's many reasons why you'd want to switch to advanced class. Uh, for Perfect Paladin, he has some great combat strengths. Uh, Paladin represents the epitome of what it means to be a wonderful fighter. So they automatically win the first round of any quest battle, which means that they only have to win uh, one out of one more round to win a quest battle as opposed to being a two out of three battle that most characters will have to win. So that's a huge advantage for them, uh, but they can never escape. So if they find themselves in a tough situation where they don't get combat bonuses or their magical equipment uh, doesn't work against certain creatures, uh, that can be a downside. And But they also can't be cursed. So some pros and cons to being a perfect paladin there, the biggest one being quest creatures, of course. And then they have a, a special ability called Righteousness. So once per turn, they can spend 25 gold pieces to earn a single experience. Um, so what that kind of represents thematically is that you as a paladin are giving back to those who follow you. You're creating a legend um, in your in your lore of being giving and um, being a true hero that doesn't seek to gather wealth. Um, and so that builds your experience to help you get to that 25 experience goal. And then finally you have the option for a divine light. So if you're in the same location as any player who is cursed, you can choose to remove that curse out of the goodwill of your heart. So this uh, final ability is more useful in team play or uh, potentially co-op once that becomes a fully active mode of play. Uh, not necessarily something that you'd use in the regular um, kind of race for the win kind of game and doesn't serve any purpose in solo. And that is your perfect paladin, folks. Whoops, I uh, just lost the deck. We'll go over here. <laughs> so uh, just trying to pick up that first one, actually. So the next one is Ballistic Battle Mage. For Ballistic Battle Mage, you want to be a wizard or a fighter to advance to this class. You will get the plus two combat as your replacement combat bonus. You also gain an additional two against magical and demon creatures. So as you are one with magic, you understand how to fight magic with magic. And then you have an ability where once per turn you can draw a card of any type in your hand and discard a card. So if I happen to have a reward card in my hand or an event card in my hand, I can swap it out for another one uh, by drawing and then deciding which one to discard. So it gives some versatility if you have cards in your hand that you don't like. If you have a, a five gold piece reward card and you could draw a 25 gold piece reward card uh, to replace it, for example. Uh, so it gives you some versatility each turn. And then for spell casting, uh, all of the wizard classes have a bit of versatility there as well. So once turn, the battle mage can ignore the effect of any creature ability, including quest creatures, which can be a big advantage. It can ignore the effects of a defeat in battle, if you choose to activate that. So if you're pretty sure you're going to get defeated when you face an encounter, uh, but you want to try just in case, you can have that as a backup plan. And then you could also gain plus four combat for the turn. So uh, again, these effects can all happen after a combat roll, which means that um, if you know the plus four won't win you the battle, you can choose not to get defeated instead. Um, so very useful in combat. He understands how to fight the different creatures of the realm, or she. That's Ballistic Battle Mage. Next, the Nefarious Necromancer. Now I apologize, this symbol here should be um, 
a thief symbol and a, a priest symbol. So a nefarious necromancer is a thief priest, and I'll get that corrected on the tabletop version, but it is corrected in my uh, hard drive files now. You get a plus one to your combat, so not very good in combat uh, solely, but um, they do have some great special abilities. So the first one is, if you have a curse, you get the opposite effect of that card. So if you happen to have been cursed to always get minus one combat, you get plus one combat instead. If you were cursed that you always have uh, less than, th you have three less experience, you actually have plus three experience. So that can be beneficial if you're already cursed to become a necromancer and to turn that curse into a positive. Uh, once per turn, you can exchange a card from your hand with any card of the same type from a discard pile. So if you have a um, helmet in your hand and there's a staff in the discard pile, you could swap that out. Um, if that card ever gets discarded in the future, it gets removed from the game and that prevents you from um, exchanging for a potion, using the potion, and then continuously using that potion. That would be a bit of abuse, so that's why that clause is in there. Uh, but very nice to be able to dig through a discard pile. And then they have a special ability called Animate Dead, which is, uh, depending on the point of the game you're in can be a huge advantage and for that you have to discard three cards because of that because of the advantage it could have and you can animate any creature from the encounter discard pile to turn it into an ally of yours and it gets a combat bonus so if you happen to bring back a, a bear for example a savage bear you it would get plus four combat if you brought back a diving griffin however that would be seven combat so you could really boost your combat ability with one of these undead allies and you're not restricted to just one ended ally so you could discard three cards um, one turn and then a few turns later when you've gained enough cards you could discard three more cards and you could have up to four undead allies because you can fill up the four corners so you're talking about epic power how to become a legendary necromancer uh, that's the way right there animating the dead Next up, the Aggressive Assassin is a fighter thief, so this is uh, someone who is very skilled in combat, uh, particularly stealthy combat. So they can't equip heavy armor or two-handed weapons because of that, even though they're a fighter class, they're not uh, that kind of fighter. But um, all the other equipment they can use, uh, when they defeat any creature they gain an extra 25 gold, so that kind of continues on with the thief mentality of gaining gold to gain experience or to be able to buy things. And they're, they're plus four combat, which is pretty impressive in itself, so really good in battle. And then to enhance that battle, they have an ability called a sneak attack, where they get to discard two cards and gain five combat for the first round of a battle. And so in a regular battle against a regular creature, uh, that's just for the entire battle, because usually there's only one round. But against quest creatures, when you discard two cards, that first attack could um, trigger the win for you. Um, and if you win the round, you win the battle. So it's like you scored a devastating blow by backstabbing their spine. This aggressive assassin knows where to hit and knows where to hit hard. Um, so that is aggressive assassin, fighter thief. Next we have the mage monk. So the mage monk is a combination of a wizard and a priest. So if you're either of those classes, you can advance to this. Uh, you don't get any combat bonus uh, as the base card, but uh, you'll see there they have other ways to fight. M monks are traditionally known for being unarmed, uh, but still being insanely powerful once they build up to strength. So uh, you can't have any armor items equipped, so no helmets, no gauntlets, no breastplates or, or uh, shin guards, anything that says armor on the card. Uh, but you do gain plus one for each empty equipment slot on your sheet. So if you had absolutely nothing on your character sheet, you'd actually get plus nine combat for being a mage monk. Uh, you just don't have any of the other b magical benefits you'd get from some of those cards. And you cannot be cursed. So again, that uh, continues on that priest ability. Um, and then there's a special ability you can uh, trigger is called the Mental Force. So you can place any card from your hand under an equipped reward card. So let's say you have, um, uh, uh, let's say you have a mace in your hand. You can put any card beneath that mace, and you'll, that mace will become one stronger, up to a maximum of plus five. So you can use your cards that you don't want to equip because you want to keep your monk bonus to build up one item that you have that you have equipped. Uh, so that's a way to really uh, pump up your abilities as a monk without filling up your sheet. And that is the Mage Monk. Next we have the Brutal Beast form, which is like an animalistic version of a fighter. It's the Druid and Fighter combined. Um, so when you get this, you have a core attack bonus of plus five. It's the strongest bonus you can get. Uh, again, you can't have any form of armor or equipment rewards equipped. 
Uh, so what that means is you basically can't have any weapons or armor because you're relying on your beast form to solve your battles. Uh, and you always win battles against creatures with 7 combat or lower, so uh, that's over 60-70% of the creature deck or encounter deck you're going to defeat automatically because you're epically powerful already. Um, and you might think that sounds broken, but uh, your goal in the game is to defeat uh, quest creatures and to gain the experience and legendary status from them. Uh, but it is very useful when you're fighting undead or goblins or little guys that could affect you. Um, you will have the ability to do a ferocious rage, so it's like you're, you're um, really emphasizing the animal nature that you have when you're in this beast form. You discard your hand, uh, so if you have, you have to have at least two cards in your hand, there's a clause there, so you can't do it when you have zero cards or one card. But you'll get plus five combat for the turn, which means that uh, if you're playing a quest creature and have three rounds of battle, you get plus five combat to each of those. Uh, so brutal beast form is all about brute strength, animal strength. Next up we have Spiritual Saint. So Spiritual Saint is a combination of the Druid and the Priest class. Um, and so it's a little bit more um, calm in nature, only plus one combat. It's not as aggressive as those last few cards. But you still gain a travel bonus that you inherently have from the Druid, and you can escape battles without rolling. If you do, you gain one experience. So that is um, to show that you are um, deciding when it's important to fight the most evil creatures in the world and when the, it doesn't matter as much and you just want the experience. Uh, when you become a spiritual saint, you gain a Pegasus, which is an ally that gives you um, a plus three combat. So that goes in line with the spiritual saint card. That's the only way you can get that ally card. And um, it fills in one of your item slots. So when you think about it, it's actually a plus four combat instead of uh, plus one. And then you have Faithful Turning. So if you face an animal creature, you can discard two cards to turn that creature into your ally and still become victorious and get the benefits. So I could win a battle against a savage bear by discarding two cards and that bear becomes my ally. So unlike the Necromancer, it doesn't pull it from the discard pile, it actually pulls it from a live battle and turns that battle into a win. Plus you get the creature as a permanent bonus. So that is a Spiritual Saint. Next up, we have the Relentless Ranger, and that is the Druid and the Thief together. Uh, so becoming a strategic fighter slash uh, nature hero, if you will. Uh, plus three combat strength for that, and you gain an additional plus two when you have two weapons equipped. So again, uh, and a, a few videos ago, we talked about Drista Worden being a legend. Um, he's well known for his dual scimitars, uh, and rangers often have the ability of... Um, uh, specialty with two weapons, so this is to represent that. If you gained experience during the adventure phase, you actually gain an ex extra experience during your end step. Um, as a ranger, you become notorious uh, throughout the realm for your, your defeats and your, your important battles that you accomplish. And if you want, you can create a legendary battle by discarding three cards, and you'll gain an additional three combat. Um, so uh, not as powerful as some of the other cards that give you bonuses, but if you defeated at least one creature that way, you gain two more experience in the recovery phase for a total of three. So the ranger isn't hugely powerful, but when they do win, they really um, represent that win with experience. They be, become very recognized in the world of Novus. Next up, if you are a wizard or a thief class, you can become a time thaumaturgist. What's a th thaumaturgist, you ask? It's like a time uh, tra time thief is kind of what that word is from. Odd word, but I, I liked it when I found it online, and that's why I'm using it in my game. So um, hopefully you could become fond of that, even if you can't pronounce it the first couple times. A time thaumaturgist is not designed to fight, so they get plus zero combat. Anytime you would draw an encounter, a reward, or an um, adventure card, you can draw three cards cards instead, pick the one you want and put the other two on the bottom of the deck. So you really are um, seeing into the future uh, and deciding what the best path is for you. Um, and when it c talks about time thief, once per turn you could discard three cards to gain an extra turn. So that's what the thief part of it is, you're stealing another turn. Uh, or you could gain four combat, or you can gain... Um, 
plus 25 coins just for the turn. It's not a permanent 25 coins, so you have to use it during that turn is what that represents. Uh, so a time thief is a different way to approach the game in terms of how to really manipulate your card draws and take a few extra turns. Not the greatest in combat, but maybe through your manipulation of cards you can find more of the adventure cards that give you experience, such as quests or um, some of the encounters that you know that you can defeat instead of getting beaten down by the stronger guys, knowing that your combat strength is a bit lower. That's a time thief. Um, and the last one we have is the Superior Summoner. So Superior Summoner is the Wizard and Druid combination. Either of those classes can advance to this. Only a plus one combat. Uh, you still retain that plus one travel. Again, that's a really good ability to have. Uh, normally both the Wizard and Druid have that, so it's nice to continue that on. You get to draw an additional event card at the, or adventure card at the beginning of every turn. And if it's a curse, you don't even get cursed, you can discard it. So it gives you a little bit of a uh, extra card advantage there, which can be used for discarding to, um, to make s allies, for example. You can discard an one card from your hand for each ally you have in play to gain another ally. Uh, so in essence, you could gain um, four animal allies onto your deck. So you could earn up to plus eight to your combat strength by filling up those item slots with ally cards. Uh, so earning those extra adventure cards are good in themselves, and if you don't like them or don't need them, you can convert them into allies. And there you have it. That is all ten of our... Um, advanced class characters and a uh, really fun part of the game because it really adds to the versatility and, and replayability of the game because maybe one game you want to figure out what is it like to become a perfect paladin or was was it like to become a mage monk um uh, how can I take advantage of this necromancer and really bring stuff back from the dead? Or do I really want to go all in and, and fight as a animalistic creature, for example? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think I'm missing one here. I think I might have went flying. If I miss one, call it out in the comments. I apologize. Uh, I'm always doing these late at night and just for some fun ways to keep the Kickstarter engaging and keep sharing my thoughts on, on how the game was designed and some of the components. So hopefully you like what you saw and uh, thank you again for watching these videos. Have a great day.